Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part three of our workshop on SDGs and mapping mangroves. For today's part of the workshop, we are going to be focusing on creating apps in Google Earth Engine and going through some examples of how apps can be used to communicate the results of different analyses that we perform in Earth Engine. Again, this course is structured as three one and a half hour sessions. The first session was held on November 5th. The second was on the 12th and today's session is on the 19th. The same content is available at two different times each day. The first session occurring from 10 to 11.30 Eastern Standard Time. The second session is held from 3 to 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. Webinar recordings, PowerPoint presentations, and all homework assignments can be found after each session on the Applied Sciences website through this link. And we will have a questions and answers session following each lecture. Or if you are unable to get your question answered during that time, you can reach out to us at our NASA emails. After each session, there is a homework assignment available through the RSET website. Answers for these homework assignments must be submitted via Google Forms two weeks after the workshop. For those that are able to attend all three webinars and complete the homework assignments, you can receive a certificate of completion. You have to complete the homework assignment by the deadline through the RSET website, and you will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martins. We listed some prerequisites on the RSET website for this course. For today, we will not be using QGIS, but if you want to go back to previous sessions, you will need QGIS 3.10, and you will need to download and install the class accuracy plugin for QGIS. We've also provided additional resources, such as fundamentals of remote sensing, intro to JavaScript for Google Earth Engine, and you will need to create a Google Earth Engine account if you've not already done so. We've also provided links to the GEE Beginner's Cookbook and a link to GE Managing Assets, as well as an introduction to Google Earth Engine tutorial. By the end of today's session, you'll be able to use previously created mangrove maps to create a Google Earth Engine app, which will be used to present the results of any analyses we've done, and you will understand how to add functionality to various app widgets. So last time we went over how to use a random forest classification to construct a mangrove map in Earth Engine using satellite imagery. But today we're going to focus on how we actually communicate results from an analysis like that. There are ways to share your code with other Earth Engine users. However, there are many users that we work with that do not have a coding background, and we want to make sure that our data is equally accessible to all parties involved in our projects. Earth Engine apps help us communicate technical analyses to a non-technical audience because we remove the step where we have to interact with the code editor. So there is no longer any need for your audience to understand JavaScript or to understand how Earth Engine works. They can just interact with a public user-friendly format. There are some really great examples of other studies and other groups that have used Earth Engine to create very interactive apps. So, for example, Global Surface Water has this explorer tool that allows you to look at water surfaces over the globe um, in, over the past three and a half decades. There's also the Global Forest Watch through Hansen et al. that takes the results of that data and makes them readily available so that you can explore forest loss and forest gain at a global scale. Earth Engine also has a MODIS Ocean Temperature Explorer app that allows the user to click around anywhere on the globe and see a time series of ocean temperatures over time. So to give you an example of a couple apps that we've made through our lab, we're now switching over to the Earth Engine interface. After you create an app, this is what it will generally look like. You will now have an app that has your username, 
associated with it, and then the earthengine.app website. And this is an app that I have made to allow the user to compare mangrove extent in different com different countries. And so I've given the user instructions, select regions to compare mangrove extent, and then the user is then able to click around on the map and pull some information about mangrove extent as recorded by different global mangrove indices. So for example, this is the Bahamas, and here I've given the user information on the Global Mangrove Watch, as, we're at, as well as Geary et al. So two different global mangrove data sets that the user is then able to compare. And here I've also given the functionality of allowing the user to toggle on different layers of interest. So for example, we could take off that top GMW layer and look at just the Geary layer. And we can also see where those two layers intersect. So that's one example. It involves graphing. It involves having these checkboxes that the user interacts with. And it also involves a clicking mechanism that pulls some sort of argument when the user clicks on the screen. Another app that's been created through our lab is this Global Mangrove Drivers app. And this is going back to the example study that Lola was talking about on the first day of this workshop. So this is work that came out of our lab this year. And this is just going through some of the results of that study looking at uh, global mangrove loss drivers. The user is able to explore different areas of hotspots. So right now we're in Bangladesh. We could move over to Jamaica and explore that area. And the user is able to work with these drop-down menus to explore um, epoch of loss, as well as land cover changes, what land cover is changing to, and then also drivers of those losses. So here we have now this drop-down widget, and we also are providing a legend to the user to make it very clear what we're trying to present. So those are just a couple of examples of the capabilities of Earth Engine apps. So as we go through the process of constructing an app through the demo portion of this workshop, we are going to be using a number of widgets. And widgets are any component of a graphical user interface or GUI. So when I say app, I could also say GUI. They're, they're a bit interchangeable in this context. Graphical elements like graphs that pop up or drop down menus are designed to allow the user to manipulate components using just their mouse and not having to interact with the coding portion. So some examples of this could include panels, buttons, those check boxes that we saw in the apps I just showed, graphs, slider tools, thumbnails, and there's also a, a wide variety of other elements that you could include depending on what you're trying to show. So now we're going to go into a demo of how to actually create an Earth Engine app. And for today's purposes, we're going to build off of the work we did last time with constructing a mangrove extent map in Guyana. So the end result we are working towards today is this Guyana Mangrove Explorer app. And it's going to look something like this. So we are going to create functionality to allow users to explore mangrove extent in three different years. We are also going to load in Simard et al's data on mangrove heights so that the user can overlay that with mangrove extent and explore that data set. We are also going to include graphs in our final panel that will show how total mangrove area has changed over the course of these three different years. To follow along with the script, you can follow this link and it will take you to the finished script of this app. Again, much like last time, I'm going to be moving through the demo fairly quickly and you will always be able to refer back to the RSET website to come back to this training if you would like to review some slides, go through it a little bit slower. But for today's purposes, I'm going to be moving through the demo fairly quickly.
So to start off, I've actually made three different mangrove extent layers available to you. So if you were unable to get through the random forest classification last week, or if you haven't worked for multiple years, you can feel free to go ahead and use these layers. That's what I'm going to do. So these are drafted layers that I've created of mangrove extent in Guyana in 2000, 2010, and then in 2020. So this time, instead of actually going to my assets and lo loading these layers in manually, I'm going to type out the code to do that. So if you know the image collection ID or you know the asset ID of the image or table that you want to use, this is an alternate way of pulling those assets in. Some people find that this is more streamlined because you don't have to keep interacting with your imports tool up at the top. Um, but this is a way for you all to have access to these layers of interest and they're they're publicly shared. If at any point you have an asset that you would like to share with a colleague, the way that you do that is you go over to the asset of interest, you click the share icon, and then you can either share it with a particular reader or you can make it available to anyone. So that's what I've done for all of you today. So we now have access to Mangrove Extent in 2000, 2010, and 2020. I also want to pull in two additional assets. So the first is going to be this SIMR data set, which reflects mangrove height. And then I'm also going to pull in a feature collection that is the Guyana mangrove border. So what I ended up doing here was I exported the study area that I used to map mangroves in Guyana during these years. Um, and I exported that as a feature collection to my assets. So now I can just keep you reusing that exact feature collection instead of having to continuously redraw that geometry. Now you'll notice that the SIMR data set comes as an image collection. So we are going to quickly mosaic that because later we're going to need to clip it and we can't clip an image collection. So now we have all of our data sets assembled. We have the SIMR data mosaic to where we need it, and we can start moving into creating this app. So the first thing that we're going to do is similar to how we actually set up the map for our own purposes and for our own interactions. And we are going to set up the display by putting the background as satellite. So we use map.setoptions, and all we have to do is type in satellite so now every time our map loads, it's going, to, it's going to load with this satellite background rather than our Google Maps background. Next, we're going to center the map to our study area. So again, this is referring back to this Guyana shapefile that I pulled in. And I've zoomed it in here to nine. Again, we could change that zoom, and then that would change how our final app looks. But I think 9 is pretty good, so I'm going to keep it there. The next thing that I like to do is I want to set the cursor as a crosshair. So right now, as we are moving our mouse over the screen, we see this little hand. We can change the style so that the cursor is now a crosshairs. And it just makes it easier as the user is clicking around to see where they're actually clicking. So if I run that, and again, I'm using Control Enter because I'm on a Mac, you can use Command Enter or you can hit Run at the top of the screen. But now you'll see that my cursor has changed to a crosshairs. Next, we're going to be setting up for some of the visualizations that will come in later in this app. And we want to display our SIMR data set, our height data set, with the Veritas color scheme. So what I've done here is I was able to find someone that had listed out the hex color codes for Veritas. And I'm going to set up my visualization parameters using those color schemes. So I'm making this variable for Veritas. I'm setting my minimum and maximum values for display. 
And then within the square brackets, I'm filling in all the different colors. So it's going to display in this order of the color scheme. But for now, I'm just going to leave that. The next thing that we're going to do is we are going to start setting up our layers. So instead of using map.addLayer like we have in the past, we are going to create layer objects or layer, um, layer UI objects that we can pull in given certain commands. So we will do this for each of the layers that we want to display. So for example, with the SIMR data set, I have created this variable SIM HBA. And instead of using map.addLayer, I'm using ui.map.layer. Now, if we wanted to see what that means, we could look that up in our docs tab. And we can see that ui.map has all these different capabilities. And we can see that ui.map or ui.map.layer creates a layer generated from an Earth Engine object for display on a ui.map. So UI is always referring to different widgets and tools that are going to be displayed on our user interface. So we could easily see what capabilities are available through a uh, user interface. We have buttons, we have charts. Um, there's there's a whole host of capabilities. So definitely feel free to check those out as we go along or after the tutorial, because what we're seeing, what we're going to be going through today is just kind of scratching the surface of what capabilities are available through Earth Engine apps. So we're going to repeat this process for our extent layers. So for SimArt, I pulled in the Spiritus um, visualization parameters. For the extent layers, I'm just going to give them each a solid color. And because they are only displaying where mangrove is, and I've given values of mangrove a value of one, we only need to display from one to one. So I have created all these map layers. The other thing to note is that I have included false at the end of calling in these layers. And that's because I don't want them to automatically display on my map. I want the user to have to do something to get them to display. So it is easier for them to understand and see what they are visualizing. So I will run that, make sure that it works. But even though I have created these map layers, they are not currently displaying and they're not even listed as a layer. Now, the way we get those to list under our available layers is we use map.add. So now we're adding these variables that we created. And now I see that these layers are actually options for me to display. So through the user inter through the code editor, I can display these layers if I want to, just to make sure that they are there and they're displaying correctly but we are going to add some additional widgets and functionality so that the user can have an easier time visualizing these layers. So this is where we get into creating panels and widgets, which are really going to add to the display of our app. First, we need to give our app a title so that the user knows exactly what we are trying to demonstrate here. So for this example, I'm going to give this app the title Mangrove, Diana Mangrove Height, Extent, and Loss Explorer. So I can use ui.label to create a label. And then I can also give it additional specifications. So if you have previous experience with web design or HTML, this may look a little bit familiar to you. But essentially what we are doing in these curly brackets is we are specifying font size, weight, and color. So this is going to be 25 pixels. It's going to be bold font, and it's going to be this color, which is, is I believe, some sort of teal. You could skip all of this and go with the defaults, which is going to be smaller and will be black text. But for making this a more attractive looking app, I am putting in these specifications. 
So the next thing that we want to do is we want to include some information about what this app actually does and provide a summary of what the user can use it for. So here we are going to create another label. So we create this variable for text, the so UI.label, and then we include some text here about the data and how we derived it. And then again, we include font size. So here I've included this tool maps mangrove extent in Guyana in 2000, 2010, and 2020 using a random forest classification derived from Landsat imagery. So here I have some information about what data is included, how it originated, and what satellite we use to produce this information. And then below I say use the tools below to explore changes in mangrove extent and mangrove canopy height in 2000. So again, moving on from describing what the data is that we're including, we are giving some form of instruction for what the user can do with this app. So right now we have this text available, but we haven't actually placed it anywhere. So we are going to create a panel. And for that, we use ui.panel. And within parentheses and curly brackets, we include some sort of information about what we want that panel to hold. So under our widgets, we can pull in this header variable and this text variable. So this is going to be added to our panel. And then for style, we can include some information on how wide we want this panel to be and what position we want it to be at. So I've chosen middle right, and you can play with which direction you want this panel to display. Before we actually add the panel to our map, we are going to create some additional text that I want to include for helping the user follow the app. A lot of this is simply best practices on making sure that your app is clear at communicating the information that you want to communicate. So for separating out our panel a little bit more clearly, we are going to use a line separator and then we are going to include some additional instructions. So under here, we are going to create another panel and this is going to be housed within our main panel. So you can create several different panels and house them all within one larger panel. Some people find that this is an easier way to construct your app because it's easier to stay organized. So in this new panel, we are going to create another label. And this time, all I've done is I have just used the underscore key to create a solid line. I'm giving it a bold font weight, and then I am giving it a color. Additionally, I'm creating a label with instructions that say select la layers to display. Again, with some styling information here. Now we have our main panel, which is called panel, and we have this intro panel, which is called intro. And we need to add this intro panel to the main one. So we just use panel.add intro. And now we're going to actually display this panel. So we can use ui.root.insert panel. And what this is going to do is it's going to shift our whole map over and have the panel display all the way on the right. I personally prefer using the root insert when I have a large panel like this because it makes it a little bit cleaner. However, we have other options available to us through map.add. So we could just do map.add panel. And here we still have our panel, but now it's kind of just floating. I personally prefer it to be all the way over, taking up this side of the screen, but that may be different from your personal preferences. I definitely recommend playing around with that. For now, we'll stick with this ui.root.insert panel. So now we have our panel, we have a title, we have summary information, and we have some sort of instructions. The next thing that we need to do is we need to add some widgets that actually allow the user to interact with the app. So 
So we are going to end up creating a series of checkboxes that the user can interact with. The first thing we need to do is we need to label this section. So we are going to create this ext label, extent label, using ui.label, and we are going to give it the value mangrove extent. So the next series of checkboxes that we are going to provide are all going to be related to mangrove extent. So here I have three checkboxes that I have included. So one for each of the years that I would like to display. And all we do for this is we say ui.checkbox and we give it a label. So what we're going to see it when we load this and when we add it to our panel is we will see a checkbox that is labeled as 2000. And we are going to set it with the value false, which means that when it loads, it's going to be unchecked and then the user can check it. Now, if we were to add these to our panel right now, you, the user would be able to check and uncheck this box, but it wouldn't do anything. Later on, we're going to actually add some functionality so that as the user is manipulating these checkboxes, things happen on our map. We want to do the same thing with the SIMR height data, and we want to give it a new label to section this data off. And we're going to give it the label mangrove height, and then we are going to cite our source, which is Simard et al. 2019. And again, we are just going to use ui.checkbox to create a checkbox for the Simard data set. Now, we want to make sure that as we have this information display, we are making it very clear what each value represents, and as different map layers display, we want to make sure that the user understands what each color pertains to. So we're going to add a legend to our map. First, we're going to set up a legend for our different extent layers. So we are going to use ui.panel, and we are just going to create a new panel to hold our extent legend. So the three different ears that we'll be displaying will have a legend included in this panel. To create a legend, you can use the following function. This is a function that, like many, we end up copying, pasting, and reusing. You don't necessarily need to understand every single line of it, but you do need to understand which lines need to be manipulated. So if we turn this function back on, we are creating a function so that each color that we are interested in has a row associated with it and has a label. So we create this label for color box, and we are going to create a label that is, is simply a colored box. So the background color is going to have the hashtag and going to include whichever color we're referring to. And we'll give it some padding since some of this is stylistic. Next, you want to make sure that each box that displays for each year has a label, and we're going to do that with this ui.label for description, and the value is going to be name. So again, these parts of the code are referring back to the inputs to the function. And then finally, we are going to return a panel, and it's going to have the widgets of the color box, so all these different colors that we are including, and then description, so the labels that will be associated with each color box. And we're just going to give it a, a, a horizontal flow here. So this whole function, make row A, is going to create that legend for us. Now we want to create a palette with the same colors that we use for each extent layers. So if we've forgotten, we can always scroll up to the top of our code, see how we colored those layers in when we displayed the map layers, and then refer back to our legend. So we create this variable palette map A, and in square brackets, much like how we set up the Viridis color scheme, we set up the colors associated with each year. So I've made sure that I've included colors for 2000, 2010, and 2020. And then I also want to make sure that I have the list of names that I want to associate with each year, and I want to make sure that this order follows 
the order of the colors. So I want to make sure that this label is going to pop up by the correct color associated with it. And now we are going to add colors and names to the legend. And these values, so I is less than three, these values will change depending on how many colors you have in your legend. So for example, if I had a 2015 value here, I would have to change this to four. So this number just reflects how many rows that you are making. Let's change that back. So we don't have data for 2015. So now we've set up everything we need for our extent legend. We need to do the same thing for our height legend. Now, this is going to be a little different because we are using uh, the Viridis color scheme and we want to display that as a single band with visualization parameters. So this requires specifying a minimum and a maximum value, and it's going to show as a stretched color scheme. So we are going to use another function here. And here we are going to essentially create a pixel longitude and latitude. And this is going to create a stretched bar that we can visualize. And we are going to create our gradient, which is going to pull in the Viridis color scheme. This is going to show up as a thumbnail. So we use ui.thumbnail and we give it some dimensions. And this can change depending on how wide and how tall you want that color scheme to appear as. It's going to be held within a panel, and it's going to be given some labels. So we want to make sure that we've added these widgets for UI.label, and it stretches from 5 meters to 45 meters, so those are the labels that we'll be including. And then we add this panel layout flow. We add some values for stretch. It's going to have a horizontal stretch. We give the panel some height or some width rather, and then we give it some padding. And this is going to return this new panel that we've created, which houses a thumbnail of our Viridis color scheme. Now we are finally going to add all these widgets to our panel in the order that we want them to appear. So you'll notice even though that I, I created my extent legend after I created my height information, I'm including it earlier on so that's associated with the right check marks. So first I'm adding my label to show that we are showing extent maps. Then I'm adding all my different extent layers for the check marks. I'm adding a legend and then I'm doing the same thing for the height information. So now if I run this, I will see that these widgets have been added to my panel. Again, we have our check marks. If I click on them, nothing happens, and that's because we still need to add some functionality. But we can see that everything's displaying the way that I like it. We have our legend for extent map, we have our legend for the height map. Next, we're going to add functionality to our widgets so that when the user interacts with them, they are now able to visualize different parts of the map. So the way we do that is we create a new function for each check mark. So for our 2000 data set, we are going to create a variable called do checkbox. We are going to create a function, and in this function, it's going to refer back to this UI layer that we created. So this layer that is showing up on here but is not showing up on our map because we set it to false. And for the checkbox associated with this layer, we are going to say on change. So anytime the user interacts with the checkbox, 
it's going to do something based on if it's checked. And if it's checked or not, it is going to change if this layer is shown or not. So we're saying our extend layer for 2000, we are going to set it shown based on if this checkbox is, is checked or not. So if it's not checked, it will turn back off. And when it is checked, it'll turn on. And then we are going to close off that function. And then in this next line, we'll just say do checkbox with our parentheses. We're going to end up doing this for each of our checkboxes. So we have one set up for 2010. So on change, it will change if this layer is shown or not. And for 2020, same thing. And then for the SIMR data set, same thing. So even though this is a different data set that we're interacting with, it's not extent mapping, but we still want it to show based on if this particular checkbox is checked or not. So let's run that and we'll see what happens. So again, nothing is showing, but now if I click on a year, different layers will appear. So I'll zoom in to make that a little bit clearer. So now we're seeing 2000, 2010, and 2020. And the user is able to change the display based on what they're interested in viewing, changed on what they feel is most informative to them. And then we can also view the SIMR data set. And we can see how that aligns with our extension. So this is just some basic functionality that we've now given this app. But we want to add a few more things. So we are going to add some functionality so that when the user clicks around on different parts of the map, something happens. What I've chosen to do here is allow functionality for the user to click around on the SIMR data set, on the height map data set, and get some information on what height is at the pixel that they've clicked on. To do this, we are going to add yet another panel, and we are going to call it Inspector. So this will be our Inspector panel that will pop up as we click on the map. So we've just given it some basic instructions for creating a, a small panel. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add a label to the panel. So we're going to use inspector.add ui.label, where we'll give it instructions, click to get HBA, so click to get height information. And then we're going to add this to our map. So now we have this new inspector tool. I can turn on my height data set, see where I'm clicking. And you'll notice that we haven't added any functionality. So again, as I'm clicking around, nothing's happening. So this next part is where we actually create a function to give this panel some form of instructions. So to add functionality, we are going to use this function. So we are going to use map.onClick. And then we are going to create a function that we're going to call chords. And as we run this function, what we're saying is when the user clicks on the map, we want this inspector panel to clear. So that'll be the first step. We want to make sure that the inspector panel stays shown. So otherwise, the inspector panel will completely disappear. So we just want the text to clear but we do want that panel to display. And then it's going to replace that click to get HBA text with a label that says loading. So this is a nice thing to add so that the user can see that something is happening if they have to wait for a value to be calculated or loaded. Um, Earth Engine does not do this automatically, so we have to add in some sort of label just to indicate that what you've done is working. You just need to wait a little bit because Earth Engine is running some calculations. So we add this label for loading. And then we need to compute the value of height at a particular area. So we get our point, so the area where we're clicking, 
by creating a geometry from the longitude and latitude of where we are clicking. So this is interacting with what the user is actually doing. We are going to reduce our HBA, so our SIMR data set, just to pull the first value. So it'll get the value at that particular pixel. And it's going to reduce region, so essentially just sample to get that first value of that point with some sort of buffer, so 30 meter buffer. And then it's going to get that first value. So all of this is working to look at where is the user clicking and what is the value at that pixel. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to create a function within this greater map.onclick function that is going to make sure that the value that the user is selecting shows up as a result. So we are going to evaluate this function result. Again, we'll clear the inspector to get rid of that loading message. And then we are going to add a label with the result. So to the inspector panel, we're going to add a label for HBA and then plus result, which is referring back to whatever is being pulled out through this process, through lines 312 through 315. And then we use dot to fixed to because otherwise we're going to get a series of decimal points. This makes sure that we only have two values after the decimal point. So it just makes it a little bit clearer. And then finally, we want to make sure that the user can close out of this panel if they are done with it. And so we are going to add a button that will display only after the user has clicked on the map that will have a label for close. So again, much like everything else that we're doing to create a widget, we use UI.button. We add a label and then on click. So when you click this button, the inspector tool is going to have it's style set so that it does not display. So shown is false. So let's run all that. Let's look at our mangrove data set for height. And then if I click around, it'll say loading and then it's pulled out the height value. So we can get some more information even though we have made it relatively clear from our legend what the values are, we can click around on the data set to see what the exact value is at the pixels that maybe are interesting to us. So you can use this for displaying NDVI values. Um, it, it's just a nice way of giving more interaction to the user to just, just play with those numbers and see, okay, like I understand what values are being pulled, I can understand how this is being displayed. And then if the user is done with this, they can click close and the inspector tool goes away. But if I were to click on the map again, if I wanna pull up that information again, I just have to click again and it shows right back up. So we've added that additional functionality to our map. And then the last thing that we want to add is we want to add some graphs with information about how mangrove extent may have changed for the different years of our study. So what we'll end up doing is we will repeat the same process for each three years where we measured mangrove extent. So we'll start off with 2000. Now we are going to use uh, some reducer to get how much mangrove extent there was in 2000. So we pull our extent layer for that year. We multiply it to by ee.image.pixel area so we can get actual values for the area in meters. And then we are going to divide it by 10,000 to convert it to hectares. Next we use reduce region to get the sum of how much area there is in this year throughout our study area. 
Now you'll notice here that my scale has been bumped up pretty high. It's been loaded to 1000. You do, if, if you are able to, you want to lower that number, but sometimes for display purposes, it is hard to get it to the scale that the data set is available in. So just for getting it to load more quickly, I've put the scale to 1000, but if you are able to get it to load quicker and you're able to get it down to 30 meters, then that's a little bit more accurate. And we want to pull the classification band because that's where we have the information on if this area was mangrove or not. So now we want to get the area within the Guyana region, and we create a feature using our Guyana shape file. And then we are going to create this variable, feature2000 equals Guyana, this Guyana feature that we just created, and we're going to set 2000 is the number associated with mangrove area in this year. And we are doing this because this is what we're going to be pulling in to display a chart. So next we're going to actually construct that chart. So we'll create chart 2000 is UI.chart. So again, user interface chart. And we're going to chart a feature by a property. So we are going to chart this feature which is our mangrove extent in 2000. And we are going to label it with the year 2000. And we will give it the label total because we're looking at total mangrove extent in that year. And then next we just need to add some titles and labels to the chart. So we will take this variable chart 2000 and we will say dot set options. We'll give it a title for total mangrove area. And then we'll label our axes with area and height, and then year for our horizontal axes. So we can run this to make sure it works, but again, we have not added it to our panel yet, so it doesn't yet display. We are going to do this all again for 2010 and 2020. So you can do what I did, which was copied this previous text and made sure that I was pulling in the correct year of interest and move forward. Again, creating a feature for 2010 that we can pull into our chart and then creating a chart for 2010. And we'll do this for 2020 as well. Great, so now we have three charts. So we have chart 2010, 2020, and 2000. And they're all different variables that we can now interact with. What we want to do here is we want to allow the user to scroll through these different charts. So we're going to do that by adding a drop down menu to display these results. So first, we want to create a new panel that is going to hold these graphs. So we Create a variable for panel graph. We give it some dimensions and we give it a position, which is middle right. Next, for a drop down, you need to create a key of items so that there are values being displayed in the drop down. So, for those purposes, we create these variables y2000, y2010, and y2020. And all they are is just text for the labels of the different years, so 2000, 2010, 2020. For the dropdown, we want to use UI.select. So select is always going to refer to a dropdown that we can select something from. The items we will include in this dropdown are going to be these variables we just created. And then as a placeholder, so while the user is not interacting with this dropdown, it's going to say choose year. So again, we're giving clear instructions on what we want the user to do with this app. 
on change, it's going to use this function that we are about to create, select layer. So before we create this function, we are going to create this variable constraint, which is just going to be empty brackets, and we're essentially creating space that's going to be filled by something as we interact with this function. So to get this dropdown to work, we use a function that we're going to call select layer. What this is going to do is we are going to create a variable for graph, and graph is going to look at our drop down menu, so graph select, and get the value that is being selected. It is going to first clear the panel for graph. So say we already have a graph displayed, it will clear that graph and then display a new one. We now use a series of if else statements to write instructions for drawing the graph. So for example, if graph equals Y2000, so if the user selects 2000 as the year they are interested in, to the graph panel, we are going to add chart 2000. So we'll add the chart values for the 2000 mangrove extent layer. Else if, so otherwise, if graph equals 2010, we are going to add the chart for 2010. And if it doesn't equal either of those, but it equals 2020, we are going to add the chart for 2020. And then this bottom portion of the function is just filling in that constraints variable that we just created and just providing some sort of constraints to this, excuse me, to this dropdown. Next, we want to create a label for the graph, again, providing more instructions for our users. So we will have a label that says select year to display mangrove extent. And then finally, we are going to add all these widgets that we just created to our map. And so now we have our final app. We have some sort of instructions at the top. We have these checkboxes that the user can interact with to look at mangrove extent. We can look at height in different areas. We are able to click around on the map to get different information about HBA. And then finally, we have now created this drop down element so that you can display graphs of mangrove extent in the years we're interested in. So let's choose a year of interest. Let's start with 2000. And we'll see that now we have this graph displayed on our panel that wasn't appearing before. So we can see that mangrove area in 2000 was 36,000 hectares about. In 2020, it goes down to about 27,000 hectares. So the user is able to then draw some comparisons for mangrove extent in each year. So we have been able to create a series of apps that are country specific like this to make it easier for countries that are addressing SDG monitoring goals to more quickly pull this information rather than having to run all of the calculations themselves. Now, instead, we have an app where the user can select a year of interest that they are trying to track, perhaps for SDG monitoring, and get information on what the mangrove extent was in each of these years. Now, finally, we have to actually make this app accessible to our users and to our collaborators. The way we do this is we have this app button at the top. So we click on this. And you'll see this is the list of apps that I've created for our lab. And if I wanted to create this as a new app, I would simply click New App. 
I could choose the owner. So for example, for myself, I have myself as an owner, but I also have our lab group as an owner and I usually make apps available through our lab group so it's more streamlined. Then I will give the app a name, so Diana Mangro Explorer. I can choose to feature this on my public apps gallery. So if you, as an Earth Engine user, want to keep track of what apps that you have created and want to have a quick way to essentially portfolio some of the work that you've done, this is a great option. If you do not want this to be displayed publicly yet, you can restrict access to the app. And then you can just share with email addresses of a Google group that you've already created. So this is great if you are worried about um, having data that is fully accessible to the public, but still want to make it available to the users in your group. Otherwise, it becomes publicly available, and then you can share the URL with whoever you want to share the project with. And then we are going to use the current contents of the editor to create this app. And all you have to do is hit publish. Now, don't be worried if right away you click on the link to your app and it doesn't load. It does need a few minutes to actually process the app and make it publicly available. If I decided that I had made some changes to the app, I could refer back to where I have all of the apps under my Manage Apps tool. I click on this little edit icon, and then down at the bottom, I can change my source code to the, I can keep it at the existing app source code, or I can update it with, with the uh, current contents of my editor. So anytime I make changes to the app, I can continually update it. It's, it's can be a, um, a work in progress, and you can change it at any point. And now, if I were to click on that app, I would be taken to the user interface side of things. So this is the same link that I would provide with someone who is who I want to share this app with. And then as the user, I would get the capability of interacting with this app. So again, this has been a series of some examples of widgets that you can add to create a graphical user interface for interacting with colleagues and partners. If you are interested in exploring additional functionality in Earth Engine, I encourage you to move over to the Scripts tab. And then below where your own scripts are, you'll see that there's this drop down for examples. If I scroll down a little bit, I see that there are examples for a user interface. And here I can get code and examples for different apps. So I'm going to save my script. So that I don't lose it. And then what I can do now is I can click on any of these apps, I can run them, and these are apps that Earth Engine has made available to you for the purposes of learning how to create apps. So this is a global forest change using the Hanson data set. This is looking at another dropdown similar to what we created, but here we can play with the opacity of how that layer is displaying and we can travel to different example locations. Another great example is this Landsat Explorer app that allows users to look at Landsat availability through different dates of interest. They can apply different filters. You can select an image of interest, and you can select different visualizations. And so not only is this great for getting some idea of widgets that you may want to include, it also provides all of the code that you need to create those widgets. So here it takes you through the entire process of pulling in the Landsat imagery, 
creating options for filtering that imagery and providing a way to export that data. So there are a number of different examples here and I highly encourage you to explore them and get other ideas for how you could be displaying results from your work. We also want to make sure to link all of you to some additional resources that may be helpful for other parts of your own research. So there are some pathfinders that are available through earthdata.nasa.gov. Uh, data pathfinders essentially provide direct links to commonly used data sets with guidance on spatial and temporal resolutions. They also provide links to tools for analyzing and visualizing the data. So as you are becoming more comfortable with Earth Engine and need access to additional data sets, these are some great links. So we've included links to an SDG backgrounder, a link for a biodiversity, biological diversity pathfinder, as well as an, a health and air quality data set. Over the course of this workshop, we reviewed SDG 6.6 .6 and how mangroves serve as an indicator for meeting sustainable development goals. We learned how remote sensing can be used to study mangroves. We later learned how to use random forest classification and Google Earth Engine to construct mangrove extent maps. And finally, we created a GEE app for communicating results of our mapping efforts. We will now move into the Q&A portion of the workshop. So please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box. We'll post the questions and answers to the training website following the conclusion of the course. Again, if you have any questions following this course that we were not unable to answer during the Q&A session, please feel free to reach out to us at our NASA emails. If you have any general RSET inquiries, please feel free to reach out to Anna Prados, and please feel free to refer back to the RSET website. Thank you so much for joining us for this series of SDG and mangrove extent mapping trainings, and we hope to see you again soon at the next RSET training. All right, everyone, so we're going to move over to the Q&A session. Thanks again for joining us this morning. All right. Um, question one, is there more recent mangrove extent, is there a more recent mangrove extent data set or app such as for 2019 or 2020? So in this case, the data sets that we used were generated using the same techniques that we covered in part two of the workshop. So because I wanted to use a country-specific raster layer that was as recent as I could get it, I created this layer myself. Um, however, there are, are still layers, global data sets that are accessible for 2019. So the SIMR data set, which covers biomass, and the GMW data set, which focuses on extent, uh, both have 2019 data sets, and I've provided links to those in the, in the Q&A session. Question two, in last week's training for the time series, you used different polygons and trained the model twice. Can you not use your train model for one time step, uh, from one time step for multiple time steps? Um, so if I'm understanding this question correctly, uh, the answer is no. You, you shouldn't be using one train model for multiple time steps because we're pulling data from a particular year of interest. So essentially we're relying on Landsat imagery and training data that we chose for that specific year. If we were to try to um, reuse those polygons or you reuse that model for a different year, it wouldn't be as reliable. So it, it's a better practice to have a, a model that's specific to the year of interest. Um, all right. Question three, in GE, there, is there a share to a group concept or is it everyone or just specific users one at a time? 
In terms of groups, you can share a folder of scripts that you have. So you can make a folder of scripts accessible so that anyone who you share it with can edit and adjust those scripts. Um, otherwise, you do kind of have to either add emails individually or add or say that it's accessible to everyone. Um, but there are there are ways of, of sharing groups. In our lab, we have a shared group of assets. So um, you just have to go to the settings and, and the share settings to adjust that. Question four, is it possible to run the GE script sequentially, i.e. only a selected chunk of it? So um, unlike R, you can't select particular lines to run. So really the only way to get around this is you have to comment out the parts that you don't want to run and then comment pieces back in as um, you want to use them. Question five, does the zoom level affect the display on different screens? So it shouldn't make much of a difference on different computer monitors. Uh, it may be affected on mobile devices. And um, I think there are ways of, of checking how um, visible your app is on a mobile device, but I haven't personally focused on that too much. So I, I don't wanna speak more and say the wrong thing. Um, question six, when do you use parentheses, square brackets and curly brackets? When do we use true instead of false in the script? And how do you comment or uncomment multiple lines at a time? So the use of the different brackets depends on the requirements of the argument you're calling in. So you can open the docs tab and search for any of the arguments we use like dot mosaic or map dot add layers. And it will it will um, show you what the structure will be. Parentheses is often like if you're pulling in another asset. Um, square brackets is often if you're trying to call in multiple um, um, pieces of text and then curly brackets is often for visual parameters but you can you can look that up in the docs tab um, to we use true or false um, we can exchange that for when we have code for when we want a layer to display so if we have at the end of map.add layer where we pull in a layer to display if we put that as false the layer is going to it won't load automatically and, and the user will have to click it on, but we could decide that we want that layer to display automatically, in which case we would either omit that and the default is true, or we would say true. So every time the code runs, that layer displays. So it, it just depends on what you want and don't want to display. And then for commenting and uncommenting multiple lines, all you do is you highlight a few lines and use on a Mac, you use Command and Slash, um, and on, on a PC, you use uh, Control Slash. Uh, question seven, how do you know the code palette is for what color? So I am Googling hex colors pretty constantly. Um, so you can always Google a particular hex code that you already have. And if you want to generate more colors or you want to know the hex code for a particular color, um, you can use something like hexcoloredcodes.org. Uh, question eight, when I zoom in and when I zoom in and click on a yellow pixel, it gives me a value 23 to 25, not 45. Does the, cal does the color scale need to be calibrated in regards to SIMARD height data? So it may need to be recalibrated because it is a global data set and we're focusing on the country of Guyana. Um, I, I tried to get it so that it was displaying the same color range um, between the legend and what was on the map. Um, but at the same time, the yellow pixels cover a range of values. So they may be covering anything from the high 20s to 45. And, um, there just may be, there just may be more data in that range, um, but you can play with the display of the SIMR data set on the map and see if that holds true. All right, um, question nine, could you get HPA pixel values by hovering on the layer without clicking on the map, such as a tool tip function? 
it's not something that I've played with. I know that there are zoom tools. So, um, for example, if you hover over pieces of the map, it'll it'll change where you have like a zoomed in image of that piece of the map. Um, I'm not sure about pulling values. That's not to say that it doesn't, this isn't an option. It's just not something that I've personally explored and, and know much about. Uh, question 10, while adding functionality to the checkboxes around line 270, instead of writing the same code four times, is it possible to use a loop and make it automatic? So Earth Engine doesn't have explicit loops. There are ways to simplify your code. For example, you can store it in another script and call that script in. I am the first to admit that I'm not an elegant coder. Um, so there are ways of making your code cleaner in Earth Engine, but in terms of writing like a for loop like you would in Python or R, there, it's not quite the same. Uh, question 11, how do we export, export the final map into JPEG? As far as I know, and I, and I just took around and looked it up real quick, um, as far as I know, this is not something that DE allows you to do at present. Question 12, how would you create a bar chart for about three years showing a change in mangrove area over time? Um, there's a couple ways you can do this. One is if you have a table of values that you import and you can make a bar chart based on that. Um, the other is if you have uh, a raster file with um, multiple values for different years, you can make a bar chart with that as well. Um, so I definitely encourage you to explore some of the developer tools and some of the um, docs tabs to look, look further into creating different bar charts. Uh, question 13, using the chart at the end, when I've clicked on each year and want to go back to another year, the chart is not displayed anymore. And so I can open a new link with the chart. Can I somehow reset the function so it will display in the app? Um, you may do it, need to include dot .reset somewhere in your drop-down code, but um, I can't really say much more without seeing your actual code. Uh, question 14, can you talk briefly about what specific steps were necessary for quickly customizing and producing country-specific apps? For example, at the least, you would have to create a new var Guyana type variable for each country. Can you speak to specific best practices to make this as painless as possible? Um, in terms of making it painless, it really depends on how much data you already have access to. So first, um, if you're doing something like mangroves where we don't have as many country specific maps of mangrove extent, you would need to create or gain access to um, that raster layer. So first you need to make sure that you have the layers that you need to display. So either raster or vector layers. Um, in this case, as you guys saw on um, the second day of this workshop, I had to generate these layers. However, depending on what your topic of focus is, say if you're not focused on mangroves or you have a different region of focus where those layers may already be available, you may already be able to gain access to those. So generally what I do is I, I think about if I am trying to meet certain needs with a partner, um, what are the layers that I want to display? What information do I think is important? So not only visually, but also are there values that I need to pull out that need to be shared? So for reporting SDGs, we need values of um, how many hectares of mangroves are gained or lost in a given time period. So um, what layers do I want to display? What values do I want to display? And then I think about how it makes sense to display them. So sometimes I, I draw this out. Sometimes I just make a list. Um, Sometimes I just wing it and then I add notes to myself in the code as I'm going. Oh, make sure that you add this in here or that in there. Um, you know, depending on what layers you're sharing. Um, for example, I just worked on a new app for like an annual time series. So I have a scrolling tool so I can look at the layer across multiple years. So um, there are a lot of really cool widgets to play with and they all 
have different capabilities and um, there's different places where you may want to use them that may display your, your information more clearly. Um, so I don't know if that made this seamless, but it definitely helps to think of a step-by-step, -step, what layers do I need, um, what uh, values do I need to display, and how do I want to display everything. Uh, question 15, can you embed the app in a website with iframe or other tools? I haven't used iframe. I know that if you make a Google site, you can definitely embed it. There are certain other websites I think you can embed it into. Um, I haven't done too much of this myself, but in the future, I plan on working with Google sites to um, work with this capability. Uh, question 16. How can I find the other app examples? So if you go to the scripts tab in the code editor and scroll down, you'll see um, an option for user interface and you can expand that. And there's a bunch of different codes available with different examples. So I would, I would go there. Can HDF and C files be analyzed in Earth Engine or is it just the images? So I, right now we can only import GeoTiffs. Um, I had access to some HDF files that um, I converted to raster, and that's how I've gotten around that. Um, question 18, is it possible to create better mangrove coverage layers and improve the accuracy, the Area you zoom, zoomed in on was 80% okay, but other sections of mangrove coasts weren't identified. So um, the version that I've shared with you all for the purposes of this workshop is a draft. I have um, since created a new version of the Guyana mangrove map that we haven't published yet. Um, there are definitely ways of improving the accuracy. Um, Again, you're balancing time spent, time and cost of going into the field with how accurate we can get with current satellite technologies, and they're constantly improving. Um, but in terms of what we can do with what we have available, we can always provide more training data, especially if we have field sites where we know mangroves are or are not, that can be included in the model. And then there's also the option of um, doing post-process cleaning yourself. So the as much as we're exploring which, which models are working well, which data is working well, we're also trying to create maps that are accurate that we can, you know, base research off of. So it's not necessarily like post-process cleaning is part of the, of the process. We can't really rely on the model for being 100% accurate. So that's another thing you can do is once you have your final model, um, you can export it into another uh, GIS service or, or platform like ArcGIS or QGIS and clean it up so that it's an accurate model. Um, question 19, in some Darwin's mangrove forest area, how do I calculate height of the mangrove forest where tidal processes are actively dormant? Um, this question goes beyond my uh, capabilities, so I'm definitely more on the app generation, land cover, modeling side of, of this. Um, so uh, Lola, unfortunately, is not able to join us, so she works more with um, calculating height. So this is a question I can, I'll ask her and can answer later on. Okay, um, so it looks like we've gotten to the end of all the questions folks have had. Uh, thank you again for joining us today, and uh, this questions answer session will be hosted on the RSET website later on. So uh, with that, hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and thanks again for joining.